Well, hello there, intertubes, and welcome to Tissues Intertubes? Of the day. <laughs> intertubes. They're connected and they send data, okay? <laughs> Carry on, sorry. <laughs> Episode 11. Welcome to it. David is clearly here with me. The one, the only David Borja, and I'm Robert Mackay, and you're watching a show about comedy and queer culture and relationships. Mm. David, introduce yourself. I'm David. Back to you, Robert. <laughs> and I'm Robert. And today's episode is specifically talking about being single. So, um, our guest today is us. It's all about us. We're having a very narcissistic episode. Hell yeah. So, thank you for joining narcissistic us. Narcissistic <laughs> or self loving, Robert? Oh, <laughs> self loving. Yes, definitely. I've been thinking about that a lot lately, to be honest. Um, the difference between narcissism and self love. And so far, the clearest distinction I've been able to make is narcissism uh, has no capacity for loving other people, while self-love mm. is building your capacity to love other people. Mm. Interesting. I like that concept. I mean, I would have to ask a psychologist. I feel like they have a very <laughs> medical definition of what narcissism is. Oh, like, yeah. I would see it as a person who just, yeah, cannot look beyond themselves and yeah. they're completely self-involved. Um, but yeah. Um, if you want to speak of narcissism, if you want to follow us, yeah, just follow David at bit button on Instagram and on Twitter mm. and myself at Instagram at Robert F. Mackay. David, are you ready to be in the hot seat to kick this off? I am. I'm not even looking at the rapid fire questions that I also you have access to. Not be, <laughs> Cause I'm going to come at you like a volley. Come at me like Cleopatra. Cle Cle who's Cleopatra? Is that the sister of Cleopatra? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She's always coming at me. <laughs> She, she was the lesser known queen of Egypt, yeah. Cleopatra, and nobody yeah. liked her because yeah. her name just did not roll off the tongue. The line is supposed to be coming at you like Cleopatra, um, but oh. I modified it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, hold on to your seats and, and clutch your pearls because here comes the rapid fire questions. Yeah. What's your middle name? Ephraim. Ephraim. Ooh. What's the last thing you ate? G granola and ginger snaps. Ooh, do you prefer the country or the city? The city. What's a pet peeve of yours? Pet peeve of mine is talking extra loud on the phone on speaker. Ooh, what turns you on? Um, open-mindedness. That's <laughs> lame. <laughs> uh, dance club or pub? Dance club. If they play good music. Cat or dog? Dog. Uh, books or films? Books lately. Yeah. A vibrator or dildo? Vibrator. <laughs> uh, um, pie or cake? Pie. Driver or passenger? Uh, passenger. What are you addicted to? Um, right now, music. I listen to music more... Then I watch TV more than I watch YouTube videos, more than I listen to podcasts, um, more than I eat. <laughs> I'm just listening to music all the time lately. And it's not even like a ton of variety. I just have a bunch of songs on loop. I've been really, I don't know. It's just, it's a, a, a state I'm in. He sustains himself on music. Yeah. Notes are his food. Love it. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, there, there was, I feel like there was some insightful things in that, uh, such as open mindedness is your turn on. Yeah. Please expand. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the, the coverall for like, you know, open mindedness also means that to me, it means that you are like a more accepting person. Like you're able to look outside like your own perspective, able to like listen to other people, um, open-minded about other cultures, open-minded mm -hmm. about sex, open-minded about like ideas mm -hmm. or like different kinds of art, like all of these things that are really important to me, like art, sex, culture, like all these things. Um, yeah, so open-mindedness kind of covers a lot of that because I, I can't stand when um, someone does not ask follow-up questions uh, when mm -hmm. I'm in a conversation with them. If they're like, they sort of ask like one kind of, maybe surface level question or whatever. And then they, uh, I'll like answer and then they make almost no response, like no curiosity, like nothing because, uh. and like, 
you know, some of that is projection because I've worked so hard to like watch that in myself and like take an active interest in what people are saying to me. And then I realize not everybody does that. People are just waiting for their turn to talk. Yeah, yeah. So you you like the curiosity, you like somebody who delves deeper and looks yeah. looks underneath the rocks. Yeah. I could just imagine you being at a restaurant, like if you went to an ethnic restaurant on a first date and the person just keeps trying different foods, yeah. like he wants to order the unique <laughs> items on the list, you would just have an orgasm. You would be full on How I Met Sally. You'd just be like, oh, you he's know? trying the squid. <laughs> you know? <laughs> That would be a really memorable date. I I definitely would agree because yeah, if someone asks like, can I sample everything on the menu? Yeah, I I would get a little horny. Waterworks, waterworks. They would have a cleanup in aisle one. Yeah, <laughs> be like David's seat would be wet. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh my gosh, that's funny. That's amazing. All right, let us jump into the theme of the day, which all about something we can relate to, David, being single. Single living. <sighs> oh, it's it's a thing. Mm-hmm. It's a thing. Um, first question, we're just going to go straight into it. Through being single, through more time of being single, how has your perspective changed on it? You know, I gave myself two weeks after my breakup to try to like feel the feels, let go a little bit and just like give myself permission to just like feel like shit basically. Cause I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, this first little bit is going to be the hardest. Um, and then after that two weeks, I was pretty quick into rebound mode, like just wanting to feel uh, fun, fancy free. And uh, what's another F word besides faggy? like um <laughs> frolicky, frolicky. <laughs> um, um yeah, yeah and just like sleep around and just like shake off some of the cobwebs of like yeah i i, I do like having sex a lot actually <laughs> um and things like that mm-hmm. uh and then more so lately um it's been about how do i find personal satisfaction being my own best friend um and that has been like the biggest kind of focus right now because I'm in a situation where my roommate wants to be pretty careful about COVID. So my like sexy time is still going to be limited for a while. <laughs> How about you, Robert? And that, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, for me, I, I would definitely say a big element of it is the being my own best friend. Like that is a huge learning curve for me. To the extent that I actually had a conversation recently with my mother where I was like, hey, have I always had a need to be around people? Like, was this a thing growing up, like, you know, going to my teen years, even my young adult years and that? And honestly, I didn't get a definitive answer out of that conversation. But it's just something that, like, I think you innately go into as being a single person as being learning how to be unpartnered. And being more comfortable with yourself. And I'm still learning it. Like I struggle with it. I struggle with being on my own. uh, Being single. Not being partnered. But I also recognize that it happened pretty much right before the pandemic. So all my lessons in this happened at the worst time. Hmm. Right? Like when social isolation, disconnect, lack of community, uh, lack of motivation and self um, kind of peace Hmm. was at at a low point in history. So... I'm trying to try to temper that, but regardless of that, I still think it is just a piece that I'm, I am struggling with and I'm still trying to get better at. And, um, so the, but the longer I do it, the change that has occurred has been that I've found more of that comfort. I found more comfort in my introversion and my alone time in my, um, forgiveness so like there's something you mentioned as like i think a big thing i've learned about has been like being forgiving of myself and being easier on myself which i think is kind of necessary as being a single person yeah yeah my mantra lately is like oh did i make a mistake but am i human of course (laughs) you know (laughs) every human being makes mistakes or has more to learn that's just how it goes um yeah yeah yeah, uh, there was something that you said that stood out. Um, My mother. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that conversation <laughs> about like, yeah, wanting to be around other people um, because like, yeah, it, it gets to that space of like, oh, well, what am I like? 
what is it that I'm not getting by just being by myself? Like, yes, it's that social contact, but is it also a distraction from like whatever my internal monologue is, like whatever my self-talk is that is like hard to handle, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I I have a bit of mm, unveiling that occurred from that that came through just conversations and therapy and stuff like that. And what I had realized part of it for me is, is I think part of it is that being in a social situation for me feels like a sense of accomplishment. Mm. And I have a real struggle with if I don't feel like I've accomplished something with my day, right? Like if I haven't like hit a goal, done a thing, um, I am judgmental of myself. Mm. I am hard on myself. I uh, beat myself up. And that comes from a big old childhood like uh, history of needing to um, this come from other conversations where I need to feel like I'm accomplishing something with my day. Otherwise I feel a sense of guilt. And it came from actually my dad uh, and not just my dad. I don't want to like single him out, but just, this, I just remember this vivid memory of my dad always t- like guilting me if I would like sleep in as a teenager and every teenager loves to sleep in. And I was one of them and he'd be like, you're wasting your day. You should have got up earlier. And you're like, there's, there's so much more you could have done with your day. And I have carried that in some weird way in conjunction with whatever else influenced it, that I have this major guilt factor that if I don't accomplish things in my day, if I just have a day of relaxation or nothing, I am a bad person. (laughs) And so I think socially engaging with people is part of that, where I feel like I'm, I'm accomplishing something because I'm making connection or I'm, I'm learning about something or I'm, you know, I'm just doing a thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's weird for me. Um, how do you know if it's a good social interaction? If it's a good one, hmm. For me, I guess it's if I laughed. Mm-hmm. If I, if I feel a release, if I feel like connecting with that person, um, spending that time with the person, just let me like drop something from life or learn something new about them or myself or like some sort of like yeah just joy and yeah a bit of a bit of the fucking what is it the serotonin shooting off you know so long as some of that chemical squirts in my brain i'm good (laughs) what about you nice yeah um for me i mean it's like that give and take of like you know, being heard, but also being able to speak, right? And um, the, or like, yeah, being heard, but also being able to like support the other person, you know, like, yeah, needing both of those things. There's this idea that I've thought about quite a bit of like, um, you know, when, when I've learned to like bring a certain self to social interactions or to, um, friendships to dating, like whatever, it kind of becomes this like performance, like everybody's performing all the time. Um, Mm -hmm. And part of uh, friendship for me is that feeling that's like as close to authentic as I can be and not feeling like I need to perform for this person. Like, you know, letting them see me. Yeah, at my best, at my worst. Yeah, (laughs) like Mm -hmm. any of those things. So it's good when there's an, when the, you've been able to remove the mask yeah. and the performance mask and you're just being genuine into yourself. Yeah, when I feel like I'm not performing. And it's funny because sometimes that means I'm being over the top. I'm making pretty outlandish jokes. I'm like, you know, being uh, energetic and stuff. And sometimes that means I'm not. <laughs> and I don't feel like that yeah. today, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I... Um, it's interesting for me. I... You brought up a point. I'm trying to remember now. Um, Oh, the helping another person. That has actually been huge for me during some really low periods in the last year and a bit, right? This COVID period, which has been really tough between breakups and COVID, has been uh, helping somebody else. So if I've been able to talk to somebody else, walk them through something, be there for them, it's it suddenly gives you a sense of purpose again where there's like you're so much of your own crap going on and i had a chance to do that for a friend who recently went through a breakup and it was huge for me because i was like oh i've learned a lot of lessons and i could relay them to that person and that was just very fulfilling very good that that's a good social interaction for me because that for me was a bit of release 
right. feeling like I could be myself and be vulnerable and show like, here's the stuff I learned. Take my fruits and bear <laughs> them on your journey. Totally. You know? And like along these lines, I, I want to give a definition of listening that my therapist gave me one time. Um, because I want to say too, like, I think a good connection can be something where like I was just of service to another person. I didn't try to teach them anything. I didn't try to fix anything. I just like showed up. I was just there for them, you know? Um, mm -hmm. But the definition of listening that my therapist gave me was, um, you know you're listening when you stop thinking of what you're gonna say next. Mm, and I'm just Active like, listening. Mm, mm. Took a whole course on it. Smart. Because you're mm -hmm. smart, Robert. <laughs> oh, shucks there, Mr. Borja. Um, I'm going to transition us to the next question. Because yeah. um, sooner or later, sooner or later, David, we're going to have to go on dates. I guess. No more of these hookups. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have to do a thing where we commit to something. Speak for yourself. I'm going to be polyamorous um, and not tied down. Well, <laughs> no, no, no. Well, and you know what? Dates can lead to hookups and can end there. It's all it's all a big mixed bag. Um, but when you go on a date, when you go on that first encounter with a person, how much should you share? And what are the things you want to know as soon as possible? I think... You know, first dates, it's tricky because like you start by knowing that you're attracted to this person, I assume. Um, so you're on the date. Maybe you know them a little bit from their life beforehand. So I don't know. I, I tend to just ask what's like most top of mind, like however well I know that person. Um, but the things that I really want to know as soon as possible is... Are they over their last relationship? Um, hmm. Do they have a job? Uh, <laughs> like top, bottom, reverse. Mm. Um, <laughs> these are like the and bare how bones. Big the package. And, yeah. Um, and like, you know, are they into this or <laughs> like, do they really just like, or are they just? Uh, just like acting out some weird like do they really just want to hook up or like are they actually like kind of invested in this date as well i think that's like my foundation and then from there i don't know I'll just talk about life <laughs> how about you <laughs> wow wow that's uh that's, those are some big key ones what i tr honestly i think especially if you're starting <laughs> off this encounter online probably like three out of those five are already answered. But um, <laughs> yeah. for me, if I were really simplify it, it would be about positivity and curiosity. Okay, I want to go into that encounter myself and expect of the other person that they're going to be positive and joyous and that they're going to be curious about me and I'm going to be curious about them. Because I definitely hate the first dates where it's like me asking all the questions or them asking all the questions and there's no tennis, right? There's no back and forth. Um, I, I just find that that is a good first impression for me. And through that, I do. Yeah, I find that I find some of the answers to what you're talking about, right? I want to know if they're into this, you know, if they're interested in and, enjoy, and it's enjoyable. Yeah, I want to know that this isn't like some sort of like escape for them, uh, opportunity to bitch about their ex, uh, you know, like that they're still caught up in them. Because that makes for a very negative first impression. So my first item is not satisfied. And my second <laughs> item is probably going to be skewed because it's probably going to be them asking everything about me or me or me asking all about them or maybe even them just talking entirely about themselves. Be like, I hated my ex and I hated this about them and I hated that. Yeah. So it'll just be negative and, and lopsided. Um, and it's interesting, like the... <laughs> the top verse or bottom. <laughs> I... <laughs> find that when you get into that that sexual element a lot of it will be divulged in the bedroom or the forest or the back alley or yeah. <laughs> you yeah, yeah, yeah. but um <laughs> i find it um it is definitely from what i have learned about myself that if i i will probably never again date seriously like uh, see potential in a future relationship with somebody who is dedicated purely to one or the other. That <laughs> I'm purely a top or purely a bottom. I just will not be satisfied by that through what I have discovered about what I like in my own sexual journey. Yeah. Yeah, that's real. 
And like, you know, there, I joked about polyamory, but like if there's also no discussion of like, you know, if I want a bottom and I'm dating a strict bottom and we can't talk about some sort of random side piece or something, then, uh, you know, like you said, it just wouldn't be as satisfying as like being with someone who's more versatile. Yeah. Yeah. Ver versatility, like, you know, it's a very multifaceted <laughs> thing because <laughs> it, like, it's a multi-sided yeah, thing yeah it know? ties yeah. into that open-mindedness that like yeah just an i don't know <laughs> it's very bold to say it's an approach to life to try to be like flexible but it kind of is um yeah so i feel that and yeah, like it's yeah. true sometimes you know sometimes it's more tactful to like wait till you get to the bedroom um but there have been a couple conversations where like i'm texting someone on an app or whatever um and i'll ask them like flat out <laughs> just like top verse or bottom um after mm -hmm. like because it's a not couple, on the profile because it's not on the profile um mm -hmm. and i've had like there was one guy i said that to and he was like um uh i i think bottom but i don't really like questions like that and i was like okay so there's something going on here i don't think yeah. i want to have sex with this person <laughs> um because they were attractive don't get me wrong but like to not to just like take it off the table for me like wouldn't work like i'd need as many things on the table as possible <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah um yeah, I, I mean, I use profiles to kind of filter for, for those purposes, mm -hmm. like, because those are, like, the factual details that if I find somebody who's just, like, it's even, like, it's one thing to say if, like, my sexual position or interest is pure top mm -hmm. or whatever, it's, like, that's already a flag for me. But if somebody, it's, like, it's their title on their profile yeah. or it's, like, their description of who they are and what they're all about, <laughs> then I'm, like, you sound like you're very set in your ways and you're not very exploratory yeah. you know immediately i just have like a judgment about that so um i just yeah i'm not a big fan of that at all i just prefer versatility yeah be it in the bedroom or just as a person just like that you are open to things and curious about things and willing to try and do different stuff um passion's a big one i also noticed too mm -hmm. is that i'm like if somebody can express something they're passionate about to me very quickly within the first date or two yeah. i'm just like oh yeah you said that love it because there's episode. just they have a, a fire. Mm hmm. Did I delay there? Sorry, that was internet. Yeah. No, you're good. You're back. Okay. So then I'm gonna go to our next question. Is being single now? How do you relate differently to your friends who are partnered? I don't. <laughs> oh, <laughs> is the God, short answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Like the one partner, the two partnered people, the three, the four. <laughs> it just keeps adding. Okay. <laughs> the four <laughs> partnered people. God damn it. I, like, it's surprising how past, many you've gotten. You're like. Exactly. The past couple conversations and like friends I've spoken to are all in relationships. Like five people came to mind uh, as I was counting out loud. And like realistically, like we don't, yeah, I don't, like we don't talk about their relationship, which in some ways is a good thing because like that probably means they're in a pretty good place, you know? So, mm -hmm. so that's nice. Um, but then other times, like, I don't know. Yeah, I tend to just talk about like what's on my mind and it's been this like journey of self-love and like being my own best friend and being more compassionate and all of these things. How about you? Yeah. Um yeah, it was interesting to me because I didn't realize how many people in my social network were partnered until I was single. Like it suddenly it put a whole new magnifying glass on the people in my life that had that. And it did become more difficult for me to relate to them. Uh, it was such a shift. Um, and again, I think because my breakup and, and my t return to the single world happened so close to the pandemic. And because, again, there's like such an element of like social isolation, social distancing, social, you know, like mm -hmm. that it's just like the social element of your life, meaning those who are partnered and those who are partnered became so much more magnified. 
that that aside, I think it just, even if that wasn't occurring in the world, it still would have been a big thing for me to realize that I'm like, yeah, I have so many people in my life who are partnered and I suddenly can't talk to them about the same stuff or, or, you know, I don't feel like they can relate on some of the things that I'm going to bring up as a single individual. Uh, even though they were single at one point, it's just like that's not a focus in their life. So what I ultimately did is I pulled the people in my life who were single closer to me because it was a survival mechanism. I needed to do it to um, get through, to learn more about myself, to learn more about them, to support them and to survive the, the pandemic. It's what really did help me. Hmm. And... The hard part about it was is that I didn't want to feel like I was suddenly unrelatable to these people who are part of my life because I'd been friends with them forever and then they're good people and great and all that. Um, they it's just like it was just the reality. Things changed and I needed to change along with it and I need to learn new things and adapt. And so that's what I did. And that's how I kind of dealt with it. And I still kept those partner people in my life. I still did things with them, just not as much or I didn't talk to them as much. I didn't call them as much or I didn't spend as much time with them because what would also happen is that they would prioritize their own partners, right? Mm -hmm. They would prioritize their time with them, their safety with them, their uh, focus on them. And I'm sure I did that when I was partnered, mm. right? I'm sure I did that to a, a similar extent. So it, I was just had to kind of accept it and be like, okay, that's, that's how it's going to be. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. There's, there's so much, there's so much going on there. <laughs> Cause it's like, you know, as you were saying that stuff of like, I pulled my single friends closer, like that's absolutely what we did. Um, and just mm -hmm. to be like real with you, like while we're recording is like, I really value that within our friendship even though we're both gay single men like you know we are at a very what do they call it um pa, 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 uh, platonic platonic relationship yeah. um yeah which is except for that one time when we were really drunk <laughs> yeah except for that one improv scene where robert kissed me on the mouth <laughs> i think that probably happened yeah it definitely happened <laughs> i remember um i remember you were shaking <laughs> Is that weird? Oh, was it? Yeah. Because <laughs> I think you were like, you were leaning forward and I think you had your arm on part of the stage to like keep your balance. And oh. yeah, anyway, Robert was shaking. I made Robert shake. <laughs> uh, giggle, 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 giggle <laughs> But like, I think that's the other thing that comes into focus um, being single as well is like, where are my platonic friendships at? Like, have I been maintaining these friendships from you know, still when I was partnered versus now being single, did I leave some people behind because I was just so like my focus shrunk um, because of this relationship? And can I now rely on these people in a new context in my life? And thankfully, I have been able to, which has been really lovely. That's, you know, kind of what was nice about those couple people I talked to or the people I mentioned who are all in relationships, but I felt like we could still relate <laughs> to each other and you know, yeah. I didn't just have to tell them my hookup stories or they didn't just tell me about their relationship, you know? Yeah, exactly. No. And I, I got to say the exact same thing to you. Like I, I so value our relationship and that we were able to discover that during this because it wasn't just about you being a single person in my life, but it was also like a person who like had gone through a long, um, long-term breakup who had been engaging with relationships at a distance and who was, you know, somebody who was part of my community and went through that. Because another thing that we were facing during all this was that I didn't have access to my community the way I normally did. Yeah, no improv. Right? The, way the, the peop I couldn't go back to shows. I couldn't go back to group gatherings. I couldn't go back to just like, hell, even if during this period, if I could have, I would have like, joined a single person's meetup thing or something, you know, mm -hmm. but I couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, yeah, it was just like, there was a lot of factors in that. I was like, David is a person who I think can relate to this. David is a person who I uh, care about and I'd like to have a better relationship with. And I think is going through a lot of the same stuff. As yeah. Me. So I was like, I thought I would put an effort into that. And yeah, I, I benefited hugely from it. And so I have you to thank for that because I learned a lot about myself and about you and about how to be a single person. Aww. And something stood out from what you just said of like going to a single person's meetup is like, I wonder if that would have even been fulfilling because like being single is not an identity, 
Like being single is just a yeah. state of life, right? And so yeah. you can have people with all sorts of different identities, different interests, different whatever, um, who are at this particular place in life where they're single. Um, but I would be very surprised like if you feel like you are connecting with the group versus like, you know, maybe there's just like one or two people who you seem to click with. And like, that's just how it goes sometimes. But what I've really focused on lately um, in this like process of, you know, connecting more with myself is less about the, um, yeah, being single as being my identity, but just like what I do and what I value is more my identity. <laughs> like, um, mm -hmm. and like at the, at the bed, bed, bedrock, like the very bottom, like my identity is just, I am who I am. And, you know, I don't need to like prove that to somebody by like accomplishing X number of things or by, you know, looking a certain way or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. Because that's that unconditional self-love I talked about in that like past episode. Um, I don't know that I can like say I'm my own best friend if I don't have unconditional self-love, you know? Oh, yeah. And I think that is a tall bar to reach because mm -hmm. unconditional self-love yeah. I mean, I have definitely made a lot of progress in it and a lot of advancements. I question if I ever will be con completely unconditionally mm. self-loving. Mm. You know, like, I think that I will always have some sort of hold up, issue, recurring trauma thing mm. because, yeah, it's just kind of who, like, it's being human. Mm. Wow. It sort of depends on that definition of what unconditional means. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. I, I, I think, you know, I haven't come up with like a perfect definition, but it's like just if I always have that ability to forgive myself and always have that ability to, um, you know, just see the inherent worth <laughs> like in myself as a human being, like yeah. that's really all it is. And like circumstances change, my income will change, <laughs> my mm -hmm. like geography will change. But at the end of the day, like, like I said, I am who I am. Um, yeah. I Actually, when you were listing all those different things of like facets of like who you are and like the, the, the problems you can run across mm -hmm. in life, one of my favorite definitions of self-love, um, and again, there's a distinction between unconditional and then self-love. So if we're looking at the self-love mm -hmm. piece, was my friend, uh, another single gay male friend of mine named Daniel, who I got close to during the pandemic. Uh, he gave me this wonderful definition that... Um, for for self-love was that he's like a lot of people believe that self-love is essentially self-care which is different compared to like take a bath buy that drink uh get yourself a new sweater go for a massage or whatever that's more self-care he's like self-love to him was when things get tough when problems come up in life you do not blame yourself and you do not target yourself and that that's what self-love is about, which I am horrendous at. You know, like I, I blame myself so much and I beat myself up so much. Um, and I am learning to be better at that. Um, and that's where I question, I'm like, will I ever get to the unconditional, like 100% Zen ascended mm. into pure light version of it? I don't know. I doubt it. But I am definitely a lot better and I need to get better. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. And like, I don't know, in my experience of like getting closer to that, who knows <laughs> how much farther I have to go or whatever. It's just that like, I've noticed in the past couple months, especially after dealing with a lot of trauma related to um, childhood, like family stuff, was um, basically like spontaneous positive thoughts. It's, it's really wild, but like I will genuinely find myself um, just sort of like walking around, going through my day and just being like, I love life. <laughs> and like mm, out of mm, just like out of nowhere mm. um but it is a thought that like starts genuinely coming up or like standing in the mirror and just being like uh you know i look really great today oh <laughs> like Aww. just like really like because it has <laughs> not it has not always been the default is the thing it's been this like slow work of getting myself to believe it and it starts by telling myself that even though I don't believe it. Um, mm -hmm. And then weirdly, after dealing with like trauma and insecurities, like looking at that negative stuff and like understanding 
what it really was or, you know, getting a better understanding of it. Um, I, I like clear out the negative so that I can then make space for that positive. Because if, mm. if all I'm trying to do is like force the positivity and never acknowledge the pain or the hurt or whatever, um, it's never going to work. I'll always, it'll always like rubber band and like snap back. Um, mm. while if I only focus on the negative, that can become its own like form of whatever stagnation <laughs> because yeah. like. I'm turning myself into a project. I'm turning myself into, oh, if I just get rid of all my flaws, then then I'm done. Like, what is the goal yeah. there? <laughs> then I erase yeah, yeah. like my memories. Like, I don't, yeah. Um, so it like, yeah, it just needs that like interplay and, you know, yeah, I've just given it a lot of thought. And like yeah. since 2016, like starting therapy and like more serious journaling and self-help and whatever, um, I think that stuff has always been there, that like journey toward self-love. Um, but that's five years ago. <laughs> that's like a long time of just sort of like dealing with it piece by piece, you know? Yeah. You brought up a lot of terms that remind me of something that I think is relevant to what you're talking about and is very true of what needs to happen to make it real you're talking about rubber bands and doing things repetitively and these little moments in that neuroplasticity. So like if you were to think of your brain as a giant dough ball, you aren't going to shape it into a new form by just doing one thing, right? You have to do it repeatedly and you have to work it. You got to work that dough ball, work that brain ball, right? And eventually build it over time by doing those repeating tasks, right? Doing things like reminding yourselves of like positive things, of things you like, things you look forward to, things you appreciate, things you're you have gratitude for, because those are going to have nice little like rolls and folds and moves within that dough ball to eventually shape it to where it needs to be. But you're not going to do it with one go and you're going to do it over time and in small amounts, especially because unfortunately, if you look up negativity bias, um, the positive things that you do will have a little bit of impact, some impact, you know, on that dough ball. But the one that's going to have the biggest impact is the negative thoughts because they're going to have way more. It's like a punch versus a fold, right? Negativity is going to come into the punch and positivity is going to come into the fold. So you have to do a lot more of the positive stuff in order to get that plasticity to move into a place where like your sense of positive thought, self-love, um, just like encouragement in that is standard practice and is just um, believed because unfortunately the weighty punch of negativity is going to take the prominent position in most of your life and so I think those little practices make a lot of sense I've had to do a lot of that and I've done similar things where it's just like and sometimes it's not about the positive or it's like almost like a backhanded positive where I'm like I think when I had something that like could bring me down is like you know well I'm looking forward to this or I'm so glad I don't have to deal with that anymore. Yeah. You know, those are like the little things where it's like, it's kind of like I'm positively releasing that thing. Um, or I'm looking forward to this other thing that is going to be beyond this negative moment that I'm in. Yeah. And so it's that I think it's that nice balance of sort of like what you're talking about. Don't be a project. Don't be overtly positive. You kind of have to do a bit of both. Right. To be able to get to that good place. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's a great book literally called Positivity by Barbara Fredrickson that is all about this stuff. And it's about how noticing your personal level of like uh, positivity toward yourself, like the thoughts you have, the habits you have, um, you know, how you get to a place where like you start to build new habits, build new patterns. Um, and it's that exact thing of like neuroplasticity that you're talking about. Like it takes time and effort and like, awareness <laughs> and like not every day are you going to be totally aware of every thought you're having is is how like pernicious it gets but like yeah when it gets to a place pernicious. yeah when it gets to a place where i'm having like spontaneously positive thoughts and not having to like force myself to be grateful um i am really grateful for that like i if you told me like three years so years ago that that would eventually start happening I don't know if I would have believed it. Um, and, you know, 
I also tell myself like that comes from a certain amount of like privilege and like stability about my current situation. Um, but you know, I am at a crossroads, like going to be making some new like job application choices and all of that stuff. And I feel way less anxiety about it than I have at similar points in the past, because I think that sort of unconditional, like sense of, you know, it might be hard, but I can do this is there. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. We had all sorts of wonderful insights in that. Some tasty little bits. Uh, <laughs> Speak for yourself. I don't know if anything I said will be of value to people. <laughs> oh, it's horrible. Start from scratch. You're a negative person. Um, well, we're, I'm going to push you, force you into something more positive, which is going to be our fun of the show. Yes. Which is going to be something new we haven't tried before, and it's going to be called Improvised YouTube Video. Oh, I'm so excited. Ready, right? Yeah. Can you okay. record on your end? The Zoom call. I am going to right now. So I'm going to record our. Oh, give me that permission, Mister. Did I not? Oh, right, because I, it reset. Last time around, you did. Reset yeah. permissions. I'll get things lined up while we do this. But essentially, to explain to our viewers on the intertubes, yes, they're intertubes, <laughs> is that we are going to pretend we're like introducing a YouTube channel, and we have a random image generator. And we're going to throw back and forth to each other to explain what this YouTube channel is about. And there's going to be like an initial topic. And then as we generate images, we have to justify how that relates to the initial topic. Sounds simple. Sounds fun. It better be. I'm going to start recording. Here we go. All right. And I'm generating a random word. Uh, sword. This will be an improvised sword. YouTube video about swords. Okay, I'm going to also share uh, my video so you can see that okay. Yes, sir. All right, so. Do you want to open or do I want to open? I'm going to kick it off. Okay, do it. I might as well. I'm the host. I'll take on the responsibility. Okay. So, hey guys, welcome to my channel. Today we are talking about the long, the pointy, the two sided swords. That's right. We are going to tell you everything about them, their history, how they're made, where they go, how they're used, what they're all about. You want to get stabbing? I do. David, tell us about how swords started. Swords started in the sky. So <laughs> when the ancients were looking out at the rain, when they were looking at the mountains, they just detected a, um, a poignancy in nature. They wanted the ability to also be poignant, be pointed, perhaps. And they realized we can also craft Ooh. sharp edges. We can also create more tools. So it started with the ancients making stone tools out of carved stone. But once we learned how to work metal, Robert's going to tell you all about that landmark. Yeah, well, metal was key to it. And you know who brought metal to the swords? We're talking the women of the tribes. Yes, they were the powerhouses. They were bent over hauling metal to generate the swords that they needed to make. And they were the first ones to actually take the actual generated product, the metal that was formed, into their hands. And they held it up high and they declared this is a sword. Now, what did they first do with those swords? Well, only David can tell you about that. The women took the swords and ran through a field <laughs> just <laughs> celebrating. They were just so glad that they had the ability. I'm just kidding. They didn't do that. They cleared what? the area of men and then they had a perfect society of just women and children for, it was nearly 30 years. Robert can tell you more about uh, how that society unfortunately came to an end. Yeah, I'm going to add a little something onto that. It, it was that culling of the men uh, that happened in these fields of like lilac that it's the reason why today lilac is associated with death. So, as we all know, what came then? Well, <laughs> <laughs> lol, boom, bang, yes, omg. Things got crazy from that point forward. Suddenly, all the women were dominating. They were the prominent sex on the planet. And men were in the minority. And women took control because they had those swords. And it was because of those swords, they decided they needed to declare their approach into any certain moment. So they would come into the battlefields full of lilac, 
declaring, Yes! Boom and arg! Yes, the cries of women, and they should be heard. What else should be heard about women, David? Well, unfortunately, it was not going to last forever because (sighs) man wanted to develop offices. So... (sighs) Basic cubicles ew, sp- were their prison. I spit on my microphone. I'm so sorry. I'm so new to this YouTube thing <laughs> that I'm just gleeking all over the place. So basically, man decided women have too much power, and man came up with a ton of structures, a ton of uh, science trying to justify the reasons that men and women shouldn't be equal. Mm, and and they put them to when work. men did that, they came to this next slide, which Robert can explain. Yes. Things just progressively went downhill from there. Literally downhill into the valleys where women were forced into these workspaces where they had to drop their sword and lift up other forms of work-based technology, such as typewriters, books, pens, fish descaling. There was a lot of fish that needed descaling. And David... It was the fish that had one of the most prominent impacts on what the next evolution of the sword was. Tell us all about it. So thanks to fish, we had <laughs> we had music. And that is where we leave you on a cliffhanger before our next YouTube video where we tell you all about the origins of music. Did you have anything you wanted uh. to add, Robert? <laughs> Yeah, I just want to say we're going to release this around Easter. It is a time of music. It is a time of bunnies and it is a time of eggs. So what better way to celebrate than to strap an instrument onto an innocent animal? (laughs) And I realize now for all the audio listeners, there should be a video version of this podcast up on the BitButton YouTube channel. So please check that out. Otherwise, that might have made no sense. (laughs) (laughs) All right. I'm going to stop sharing that bad boy. (laughs) Should I stop the recording as well? Uh, You can stop. Yeah, the Zoom. Okay. Amazing. That was great. I had a lot of fun with that. Obviously, (laughs) we're going to have to have some sort of resolution for those audio people. Uh, but we were generating random images that justified each one of those little pass offs, just so you know. Out there yeah, I realized as we got to like the last two slides, I was like, oh, yeah, what about the audio portion? And that was why I like turned that game aside for the first bit. But I just wanted to do it. It's fun. It's still fun. It's still fun. Um, so that brings us to the end of today's show. Thank you for joining us. This was all about us. We didn't have a guest, but that's okay. Um, do you have any takeaways from this conversation today, David? Uh, is a Carl Rogers quote where he goes, he's like a famous, fo- famous founder of certain psychotherapies that are still used today. He goes, mm-hmm. the curious paradox is that I can only, sorry, the curious paradox is that I can only change when I begin to fully accept myself. Mm. Mm. How about you? Sounds. It almost sounds like a little bit like the only change in life, or the only constant in life is change. Yeah. Um, for me, it would be about the variety of communities uh, and realizing that we have so many different communities already in our social network that we didn't even know existed until our circumstances of life change. You know, that you pull different people closer at different times in your life, you you discover new people and new different ways to relate to people based off of the circumstances of your life. And that ultimately, as things get tough or better, you know, like look to helping out others because they're going to need it at some point, much in the same way that you might have needed it at a different point in your life. And I think that ultimately is what really makes us, I think, as humans really feel fulfilled is when we're helping another person out. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Wrap it up for me, baby. Yeah. Well, thanks again for joining us. Um, to plug ourselves, I'm Robert F. McKay at Instagram. David is at BitButton on Twitter and on Instagram. Thank you for listening to Tissues of the Day. Um, this was all about single people and single stuff. So go out there and stay wet, internet. <laughs> Freaky and wet. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Bye.